Ahmed Lahab Rigetto. To carry on with the general embryology lectures, I'm going to discuss in this presentation the development of the umbilical cord. I'm Dr. Dania Saleh, Professor and Head of Anatomy Department at Mansoura University, Egypt. We're going to discuss the following, the stages of the umbilical cord formation, the structure of the full term umbilical cord, its function, and its anomalies. At the third week of development, the embryonic disc is connected to the chorion by a stalk of mesoderm called connecting stalk. And remember that the yolk sac has an extension called allantois. Uh, this finger-like projection extends into the connecting stroke. During the fourth week of development, blood vessels form around the yolk sac and the allantois. You remember that the yolk sac is surrounded by or covered by a, a special type of mesoderm. It's called the splanchnic mesoderm. Um, Angioplastic cells or blood forming cells will appear in this area and will form blood vessels. Eventually, around the allantois, two arteries will form and two veins will form. The right umbilical vein will degenerate later on after modulation of the venous system, while the left one persists and it is called now the umbilical vein. So, eventually, uh, we have uh, two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. Also in the fourth week there is folding of the embryo because of the expansion of the amniotic sac. So after folding the connecting stalk and the allantois move ventrally. Instead of being at the caudal end of the embryo now they move ventrally. Also, the yolk sac is pinched down to form a vitelline duct and it is surrounded by what is called the primitive umbilical ring. With further development and enlargement of the amniotic sac, so the connecting stalk and the allantois are pushed more and more towards the vitelline duct. During the fifth week of development, if you look at this diagram again, remember that we have newly formed blood vessels around the yolk sac. Now they will form the vitelline vessels. And also around the allantois, uh, these vessels will form the two umbilical arteries and the single umbilical vein. So if we take a section in the umbilical cord at this level, we're going to see the connecting stalk here, the allantois inside it, and of course the blood vessels, the two umbilical arteries and the single umbilical vein. Then we can see the vitelline duct surrounded by the vitelline vessels and enclosed within a canal which is part of the extra embryonic celome, and this canal will lead up into the intra embryonic uh, celome or intra embryonic cavity. From the sixth to the tenth week of development, the major organs are forming now, especially the liver, the kidneys, and the GIT is developing, so there is no enough room inside the small abdominal cavity for the intestine so they are forced to herniate outside the abdominal cavity into the umbilical cord we call it physiological hernia so we can see loop of the intestine uh, present inside this umbilical cord normally it retracts again uh, by the end of the 10th week to the abdominal cavity So at the 10th week of development, if we revise this diagram, now the umbilical cord looks cylindrical in shape. 
its surface is covered by the amnion after the expansion of the amniotic cavity now the amnion covers the outside of the uh, umbilical cord the connecting stool can form what's called Wharton's jelly it contains inside it the umbilical vessels and if you remember we said we have now two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein also it contains the allantois uh, yolk sac and vitello intestinal duct because now the intestine is formed inside the embryo and it is uh, connected to the uh, definitive yolk sac so we call this duct the vitello intestinal duct now what is the shape of mature umbilical cord or a full term umbilical cord it's about 50 to 60 centimeters in length about one centimeter in diameter it looks irregular in shape because the umbilical vessels are much longer than the actual length of the umbilical cord in cross section it looks like this the mucous connective tissue or the Wharton's jelly containing two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein also it contains the vitelline duct connecting the intestine to the yolk sac and also the allantois about the function of the umbilical cord it is the lifeline of the baby that connects the baby to uh, the mother providing uh, him with the oxygen and nutrition it allows free movement of the baby because it, uh, the baby swims all the time in the amniotic fluid and this is good for the development of the musculoskeletal system so now the question what happens to the umbilical cord after the baby is born at birth the uterus uh, contracts and pushes the baby outside through the birth canal and the doctor now clamps uh, the umbilical cord and the baby takes his uh, first breath so what about the fate of the umbilical cord after birth uh, in this picture we can see the fetal circulation we can see the heart the aorta coming out of the left ventricle and at the end of the aorta it uh, splits into two common iliac arteries and uh, each common iliac splits into external and internal iliac arteries from the internal iliac artery the two umbilical arteries arise and move inside the umbilical cord towards the placenta in the same time we had the umbilical vein which comes from the placenta in its way to the liver and then to the inferior vena cava and to uh, the right atrium providing them the baby with the oxygenated blood so upon clamping or cutting of the umbilical cord the two umbilical arteries will become fibrosed and transform into ligaments we call it the medial umbilical ligaments the umbilical vein will also become fibrosed and form what's called the ligamentum teres uh, the allantois will form median umbilical ligament it's called the median because it lies exactly at the midline of the body and it's connected to the apex of the urinary bladder so what about the anomalies of the umbilical cord let's start first with the anomalies regarding its length if it is too long we may end up with what's called two knots in the uh, umbilical cord why this happens because the baby now moves a lot because of the too long uh, umbilical cord so it may form what's called true knots and this we can differentiate it from the false knots because of the spiral pathway of the umbilical vessels the true knots and the very long uh, umbilical cord may lead to twisting of the uh, cord and of course twisting will lead to a closure or obstruction of the vessels and the baby will suffer this too long cord can also wrap around the neck of the embryo leading to strangulation of the baby 
Also, the too long uh, cord may prolapse during delivery and precedes the baby, and uh, the baby may press by his head on this prolapsed umbilical cord, leading to diminishing or decrease of the blood uh, supply to the baby during delivery, and of course the oxygen supply. We could have a very short cord, and this uh, very short cord, because of the uh, movement of the baby inside the uterus, may lead to premature separation of the placenta or avulsion of the placenta from the wall of the uterus. Other types of anomalies regarding uh, the hernia of the intestine into the uh, umbilical cord. The baby may be born with what is called physiological hernia. This happens when the midgut loop or the intestine is not reduced back after the 10th week of development. So at birth you can see intestinal loops that are clearly seen uh, through the transparent sac of amnion coming out of the abdominal cavity like this. And finally we have anomalies of the attachment of the umbilical cord to the placenta. Normally it is attached to the center of the fetal surface of the placenta but sometimes we have eccentric attachment when the umbilical cord is not exactly at the center point of the placenta and it is away from the center. Or sometimes the attachment is at the margin of the placenta, so we call it marginal attachment of the umbilical cord. This is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. And if you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like, and share.